Dobry wieczór. Good evening. Bardzo mi miło, że jesteście z nami dzisiaj. I'm very glad that you have come tonight. I'm pleased to greet our special guest, Griti Gawiwong, the art director of Jim Thompson Art Center in Bangkok. But not only. This is actually the only uh, contemporary art center in Thailand. She will probably mention the uh, political context that caused the situation. Kritia also used to be a curator of many important shows and events. She co-curated last year the uh, 12th uh, Biennale edition of uh, Guangzhou Biennale in South Korea and also a curator of such shows like Ant Reconstruction, shown in Tokyo, Politics of Fun, presented in 2005 at Berlin's Haus der Kultur and der Welt. And she also co-curated this with uh, Rikrit Tirvaniya, uh, show Saigon Open City. And she was also the curator of the Bangkok Experimental Film, Film Festival. And she's also an important person and a point of reference, intellectual, artistic, not only in Thailand, but in the entire Asian region, uh, Southeastern Asia, most of all. She also has a very interesting practice of thinking in the fun of the function of contemporary art in this context, which she will tell us herself. Gritia, przedstawiłam Cię pokrótce, a teraz przekażę Ci głos. If anyone feels comfortable speaking Polish, we can use the translation, and also you can listen to the translation into Polish. So just take the headphones, and afterwards we will have a discussion. I hope it will be very vivid. Thank you so much, and um, thanks to CCA for inviting me here, and for everyone for not staying at home. <laughs> I hope you will find my presentations interesting, and I'm going to bring you to the sunshine of Bangkok. Um, so first of all, I would like to uh, provide the context of uh, our institution, which is quite eclectic. And it's an art center which, uh, which was established in the early 2000s as the extension of the Thai House Museum, owned and found by the American uh, officers based in Thailand uh, since the end of the World War II. So uh, Jim Thompson Art Center functioned like a kunsthalle, which has no collection, and uh, we deal with mostly with uh, contemporary art. And so when I think about our positions and comparing with other uh, institutions in the regions, it's quite uncomparable. Uh, however, the situation that we face on the daily basis might be resonant to you uh, at some point. And the term that I use anachronistic or anachronism in the, in the dictionary, it means against time or out of time. And it is a chronologically inconsistency in some arrangement, especially a juxtaposition of persons, events, objects, or customs from different periods. And uh, I decide to use these uh, words, you know, to ad which is addressed in the work of uh, Dipesh Jagabati. If you're familiar with the subaltern um, kind of philosophy, and he's a Bangla scholar who based in in the U.S. And who found this anachronism, anachronism productive? You know, it's a productive tool to understand the contemporaneity. And in the post-colonial and the queer uh, theories, they celebrate the anachronism as a visible sign of dislocations that calls what counts at a timely and what constitutes constitute histories into questions. So for both fields, they embrace the anachronism becomes a way to rethink about the contemporaneity as untimely coexistence and to claim life relationships to the past that dominant forms of historicism obscure. And I decide to use this concept as a departure point 
to locate our institution within an anachronistic context, such as in Thailand. And I think it's almost everywhere in the world that I think we, we face almost the same situation. And we are living in the coexisting time of pre-modern and modernism consciousness. So under two political structures, one is the most conservative hybrid of military and democratic government, and the other is the constitution monarchy system. So if some of you can read German, you will you see a lot of news of my king, okay. Um, Dr. Tanet Wongyanawa, the Thai scholars, uh, said, our concept of time, still based on Hindu cosmology and Buddhism, of cyclical time, which was totally against the concept of linear times of the modern world, which focused on the progress. So I don't think people are aware of this paradox. So the two difference, the, the, the differences of two concepts of time are quite confusing, and it's very difficult for us to face the reality. So therefore, it's challenging for us to work and maneuver ourselves through cyclical times, which we are trying to move forward to the future. So in this talk, I want to use Jim Thompson Art Center as a case study to explore on how we work with an anachronistic co context like in Thailand. And we are not only trying to acknowledge the co coexistence of layers of time, but also dealing with the limitations of more or less like a conceptual space, which is one, freedom of expressions, and two, a rise of hyper-nationalism and the conservative in our society. So let me give a general background of Thailand. So, has any of you have been to Thailand? Can you raise your hand, please? Or you live there? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is Thailand. We are here, a very small country. Oops. Can you see? It's very interesting that they use pink. Um, <laughs> It's, it's very important, the color is very important in Thailand. And pink is the representation of the last king, the color of the, the last king. Uh, we situated in Southeast Asia, in, in a, on a mainstream narrative, it would say Thailand is an independent country. We have never been colonized, but actually it's not true. I'm gonna explain to you later. Um, so population is almost 70 million, and the capital is Bangkok. Actually it's listed here as seven million, but I think we have about 10 million people live in Bangkok. Like for me, you know, I'm from the north and I'm not a register living as like Bangkokian, but I, I still, my house certificate is still based in the north. So the government system is constitutional monarchy and we call hybrid democracy, which is of course, you know, a combination of um, military government and pseudo democratic system. And religious Buddhists, almost like 97, 98% is Buddhist. So this is also the problem because everything in Thailand always kind of uh, focus on like Buddhist-centric uh, cultures and they tend not to kind of um, acknowledge the diversity. You know, in, in, in we also have a lot of uh, populations of Muslim and Catholics and also Christian. Coup data, 13 times. The recent, the recent one is the 2014. And we have the attempt, the fail coup data, nine times. So altogether, we have about eight. I, can, I cannot count, you know I mean? It's a bit crazy. Um, so I, I'm trying to think about how Thailand, which is very, we, we, we call it ourselves Siam, right? Siam, uh, in, in the past, how many years? five or six hundred years ago. We call ourselves Siam, and uh, we integrated, slowly integrated ourselves to the world, you know, around the end of um, 19th century. But it doesn't mean that we, we do not have a contact with European uh, people. During the colonized, colonized time, you know, I think the first uh, European or Westerners who came to, to Siam was Portuguese. And it was really f interesting that 
we don't kill Westerners like other countries. Like, why didn't we kill them? You know, I mean, it was really interesting kind of um, uh, tackle because I think because we are very small and um, the, the 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 kings and also people in Thailand is very tolerant and they're a little bit more. Cons- I mean, civilized you know, in, in terms of like dealing with um, the foreigners, which is different from uh, Philippines, Indonesia, or other like other uh, countries in Southeast Asia. And how I mean the the, the way that the the, the 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 country trying to kind of survive and negotiate with the world is one of the um, the the strategy is to be part of the world. Right, so our first um, kind of official launch to the world was uh, we, we took part at the World Expo in Paris around the end of 19th century. And then because of the dispute, uh, geopolitic dispute um, with the French and the, and the British around the end of 19th century. So King Rama V, who's in this photo on the on the right hand side, he decided to uh, visit Europe. And it was really interesting because he trying to seek the, uh, the, the allies, right, which is not um, be friend with the British and the French. So he went to Italy, he went to uh, Prussia, to Russia, and he went to Poland. Which is like, wow, you know, I mean, Thailand and Poland has a diplomatic relationship for 122 years ago. So this is very interesting information. And then we develop our kind of official kind of uh, 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 diplomatic relationship in, in the 70s. So Poland has the embassy in Thailand and it's vice versa. So b- because uh, of his, 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 he went twice, you know, to Europe. And that trip, like in 1897, it was very interesting for me as a curator and art historian. Like, where did he go? What did he see, right? So he went to Venice Biennale, and he was he really really liked um, the artists from Italy. So he he kind of invited Italian artists and architect to to Thailand and to build this. Um, the uh, the throne hall, which is Anantas Mahom, is one of the f- early um, uh, European kind of uh, modern modernization. You know, so this is wh- uh, why the the scholar now they're trying to kind of locate Thailand in post-colonial uh, theories. Like this is not true that we have never been colonized by the West, but we are even worse case because we are auto-colonized. You know, which uh, Michael Herzfeld called a crypto colonization, you know, or some other scholars call it as um, internal colonization, you know. So this is one of the, 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 the case, you know, which is if you go to Thailand in the old town, you see all this uh, palace, you know, and uh, this official building, you know, it's highly modernized, you know, which is it's kind of uh, based on this idea. So, uh, and then after that, you know, in after the early, early 20th century, I try to kind of um, locate the art events and art movement, you know, with social political context. Uh, why I start in 1930s? 1930s is very important for us because in, in 1932, it was a revolution, you know, by People's Party. So it was the time that uh, Thailand has been kind of changed the political system from absolute monarchy to constitutional monarchy. So, and, and it's also very important to notice that the, um, the, this is the time that um, the ideas of the conservative and the progressive, it's still there, you know, and that's why every time when the, peop- when the progressive rule, it's always very short time. So People's Party rule only se- around 15 or 20 years, and from then, from then on and from the 30s up until 2010, we have around like 19 coup d'etats, you know, including with the fail and the successful one. So this is like, it stemmed from that crash between the conservative and the progressive. And then because of the, um, of the, the, um, the connection between Italian, you know, and, and, and the, the, the king's kind of uh, favorites, you know, so 
He invited a lot of Italian people and artists, artisans, as well as architects to, to the country. And that's why the first art school, um, it was started by Italian, uh, Italian sculptor. And it was really funny because he was kind of uh, glorified as a father of modern art in Thailand. His name is Corrado Ferragi, and uh, later, uh, during the World War II, you know, he changed his name into Thai. It's called, uh, it's called Sin Piracy. And then uh, around 50s, you know, we still don't have the, the art museum or the art galleries, you know. Jim Thompson House started in 1950s. Jim Thompson arrived around 46. So in the 60s, there's a lot of tourists uh, coming in, you know, because of the Cold War, and Thailand is one of the kind of center of this alliance, you know, with the U.S. So so many uh, tourists came, and that's the beginning of the commercial gallery, which runs by mostly artists. And then we, this is the first time that we have the a non-profit art space called BRC Institute of Modern Art, which named after uh, Corrado Ferrucci. Sorry. And then we also have National Gallery and Jim Thompson Town Museum started to become a museum, of, uh, which is fun by the private, sorry. And then, you know, in 80s, it's still like everything happened around the universities. But I, f I felt that in the, the most exciting period, you know, in, in Thailand for me, you know, is the 90s because this is the period that I, I grew up with, you know, and it's, the, it's a turning point, you know, of not only Thailand, but the whole region, and I think it's the whole world, because the, the, the whole ideas of like the end of the Cold War, right? and everyone's trying to kind of go beyond the borders, you know, and the, the rise of globalization, you know, so, and also it's the rise of the, um, the Biennales and international uh, kind of art scene. So this is the time that a lot of uh, young artists started uh, alternative space, you know, and, and a lot of artists also went around the world, you know, and joined this kind of big binale. Jim Th and, and then uh, the, the institution started around like 2000, you know, we have Jim Thompson Art Center and we have uh, Bangkok Art and Culture Center, which is funded by the city. And we have Ministry of Culture. So it was really slow kind of public uh, funding, you know, happened in, in Thailand. So it, mean, it means that the, the, the private sector is very strong, you know, in terms of support art. 2010, we saw another uh, kind of movement in, in the art scene, which is uh, it's the rise of the museum built by the collectors. This is, it happened everywhere in Asia, especially in China. But um, around Southeast Asia, in Thailand, in, in, in Indonesia or Philippines, most of the museum was funded by the private. So only in Singapore has been funded by the public. So this is the, the, the whole context that I, I would like to jump into the early Jim Thompson you know, as the kind of uh, case study that we wanted to, to focus on. Please tell me the, the time. I mean, I'm, I'm still okay, right? <laughs> because I have so many slides and I mean. Okay. Um, so this is Jim Thompson, and who is he? He is American. Actually, he's working with the OSS. I don't know if you're familiar with this organization. It is the Office of Strategic Service, uh, which is a foreigner of the CAA. And he came after the World War, not after, the end of the World War II, 1946, to Thailand to help the underground Thai government to release Thailand from the Japanese occupation. And that was quite interesting uh, story in itself, you know. And then the, the, and then after the war, you know, OSS closed the office. So all these OSS, you know, they kind of discharged themselves from the office. And a lot of them returned to Thailand. So Jim Thompson is one of them. And then the other guy, which I really like, is Jim Thompson's friend, he that English newspaper called Bangkok Post, and Jim Thompson started to work with the uh, uh, silk, uh, silk industry. So he himself was trained as architect, and he, he was really interested in uh, uh, 
both Thai architectures and also um, a silk business. So he decided to build the house on a small canal, you know, which is like right in the middle of the city. And this canal is the opposite side with the Muslim community from uh, Cambodia who came to Thailand in the early of uh, Bangkok period, which is around 200 years ago. So the, every day, Jim Thompson would cross the canal and then he would work with these uh, weavers, you know, from, from Man Krua. And then the, the reason that he's, uh, the, 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 the business started to boom was because he took all this, the sample of the silk that uh, the, the Bancroa community uh, weave for him. He went back to New York and he showed to his friends who happened to be an editor of Harbor Bazaar and Vogue magazine. And a friend of the friend kind of recommend a costume designer of The King and I, which is a Broadway show. So that costume designer know about this uh, silk, right? So they ordered the silk from Bancro community you know, for the first Broadway show production. So this is how uh, Jim Thompson silk kind of started to um, get like uh, famous, you know, and, and known around the world. And then in 1964, uh, 1967, after he opened the shop, you know, in, 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 in Bangkok, he went to the vacation in Malaysia with his friend, and he never come back. Just mysteriously disappear. No one know what happened to him. So the house, he, he wrote the will that he would give to his nephew, you know, who's, um, the, who's working in the stockbroker in New York. The nephew doesn't, he didn't want to own this house, so he decided, you know, kind of create this house and make it as a museum. Because when Jim Thompson's still alive, you know, he, he opened to the public twice a day. And he asked his friends, who was like expats and then a, a foreigner, to be a guide. And all the money that he collect, you know, he donate to the blind school. So I think it's quite interesting. So the house was governed under the James H.W. Thompson Foundation. And it started to, to, to function like a museum since 1975. And now we have, um, so, so this is an example of the house and its collection. You know. Jim Thompson collect a lot of artifacts, a lot of uh, traditional Thai painting, sculpture, ceramic, but he did not collect textile. When people go to Jim Thompson Museum, they thought that there was the, a lot of textile collection. No, they would be very disappointed. You know, they, 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 I don't think he has any textile you know, in, in the collection. But um, you will see a very beautiful um, kind of ancient uh, artifact and objects from not only Thailand, but the whole Southeast Asia. And one of the most, uh, like my favorite and very prestigious collections is the, uh, the Buddha image in the cent uh, 7th century, which is quite rare item. And then what happened, like why, why they started to um, kind of expand the, the art center and, and um, build up the new space, you know, which we working at the moment. So in around early 2000, you know, Bangkok has a urban planning and they, they plan to build the expressway. And in that plan, one of the column of the expressway will go right to the living room of Jim Thompson House. So what should we do, right, if you're the board of the, 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 the foundation? Say, because you are not allowed to perform the political activities, you cannot protest. It was really crazy uh, legal issues in Thailand as a foundation. You cannot get involved in the political activities. So what they did was uh, they, they give the grant to the Muslim communities who protest, they protest their community because not only uh, the column will not only go to Jim Thompson house, but they will go to their graveyards and their community. So they're really like, um, 
they are not happy with that and they protest. And the, the, the foundation give them the grant to study and to publish the book about the history of this uh, Muslim community in Bangkok. So I think it's very interesting um, uh, approach. And another, uh, another reason that they're trying to kind of rethink about that institution is be because Jim Thompson House is very, um, very touristic, you know, I mean, Thai people will not go there. It's like, why do we have to go to see Jim Thompson House? You know, it's not even Thai house. You know, it's, it's a Thai kind of architecture which has been interpreted by American architect, you know. At the end, you know, it's very, very Western style, you know, but they just use kind of uh, wood and everything, but it's re-example example to the new kind of uh, way of living as Westerners. In, in, in the traditional Thai house, you don't have a room. I mean, you don't break up the space. You have open space, you sleep together, you, you, you do everything together. It's almost like a, uh, the traditional Japanese and, uh, style. But, but he divided the space into dining room, living room, and the studies. And he even have a flush toilet, you know, like in 1960s in Bangkok, no one have a flush toilet, no one has an aircon. And Jim Thompson House, uh, there was a joke that if you send a letter to Jim Thompson House, Bangkok, it will arrive. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. So what they, uh, the, the board designed was, okay, let's build the art center. You know, it's more or less like a kind of uh, temporary art space for textile because they would like to integrate themselves you know, with the arts community or with the, the Thai communities who rarely go to the house. Most of the people who go to the, to, to the house is the tourists, and tourists, they come and go on, right? So they have not really like a connection with the communities. And I think it's quite interesting because I was a consultant for, for the one of the board, and I told him that 2003, we don't even have a space. I mean, the BIMA, the, the one that has opened in the 70s, it closed down in the 80s. So it's no kind of space for modern and contemporary art. And then I, I suggest them that they, they should open for not only textile, but for contemporary and modern art as well. So they kind of listen and then they, they, they create the space for both textile and art. And this is how we call ourselves Jim Thompson Center for Textile and Art to 2003. And I joined them in 2006, you know, and we, the less change is to not just forget textile and, and, and then we do like Jim Thompson Art Center, okay? So this is how, I mean, this is the beginning of the, um, the institution's kind of history. So what are we doing in, in, in that space? I mean, when I joined them, I, I told them that I would like to activate uh, the Jim Thompson Art Center to be more closer to the communities, you know, in, in Thailand, in the art world and also in the, in the whole world, right? So we did, a, and at the beginning, they did a lot of local exhibitions, which is focused more on traditional textile, and also international exhibitions about, you know, con, more like fashion and contemporary art. And also, they, uh, you know, they work with the context of the site, the architectures, and heavily focused on textile again. So in, in 2011 uh, onwards, you know, I mean, in Thailand, we have that, we, in, in the 60s, um, in Southeast Asia, we look up at the European Union, you know, and they have a kind of uh, another versions of EU, you know, we call ourselves AES, um, ASEAN, you know, which is com consists of 10 countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, what is the aim of the ASEAN? ASEAN, it started with the ideas of the fear of communists, right? which is almost like a kind of uh, sabotage by American um, ideas of fighting with the communists because of the constructed theories of the dominoes, right? Like, okay, they're coming to China and then they will go to Vietnam. And, and it was really interesting. If, if you see the, the documentary, like today is Vietnam, tomorrow is Thailand, you know? So it's like, what? <laughs> and then the day after tomorrow might be in the backyard of the US. You know. So that's why they, um, so they, 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 they signed a contract you know, with the help of the US, like in the first five countries, 
Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, and Singapore. And they found, found the organization called ASEAN, right? So they, that the first one is, the aim is to, you know, very political kind of uh, driven. And then the second one is about economy. And then the third one is social and, I mean, um, cultures, uh, collaborations. So it took them like since 1967 that they signed the contract. Up until 2015 that they decided, okay, oh, let's work together in the, we, we should focus on economy. You know, and I think it's very interesting that, um, you know, they, they call themselves like AEC, ASEAN Economy Com uh, Communities, right? So for us, you know, like what does it mean, you know, to, to, to be part of the ASEAN kind of community? In, in, and focus on, on um, economy, like we don't really know anything, you know, about the history of ASEAN and we don't really know how to engage with each others, you know, we have no background of like what is happening in Vietnam, in Laos, you know, in Cambodia and, and the problem in, of Thailand is we always like find ourselves very unique, right, because we have never been colonized, you know, and of course, you know, our friend, I mean, you are not part of our colonial history, right? This is one thing. And the second part was, during the Cold War, we decided up with America, and then our friends, like, in uh, the Mekong region, like, they hate us because, like, you are part of America, and you like, you did not part of our, like, uh, Indochina, you know, like, French kind of... Um, previous colony. So this is like a double trouble, you know, in our consciousness. So what are we looking up for? We're looking up for the West. Of course, you know, like for my generation, the previous generation, we went to study where? In Europe, in America. And we know nothing about our neighbors. So in the 90s, you know, me and my friends, we started to question ourselves. And that's why we, we look at like an in internal kind of collaboration among uh, Southeast Asia. And we started to work together you know, and, and do more research about that. So this is how we, I mean, and then another idea was like uh, the scholars in, in, in Singapore, his name is T.K. Sbabati, he proposed the ideas of regional perspective, you know, like we should, and it's a little bit touched upon the ideas of post-colonial, like we should stop citing the Westerners, you know, scholars, and we should look at our own regional um, texts, you know, and ideas, and citing each other's, reading each other's uh, essays. And I think this is very healthy, kind of, um, for us, you know, to deconstruct our, like, very crazy ideas of looking West, you know, and know nothing about the neighbors. So what we're trying to do is we, we started to work with the, um, the regional perspective, you know, and working with the Cold War, with the collections, and then especially at Jim Thompson, it's a good start, you know, for, for, for the, doing it because we have a very interesting archive of Jim Thompson itself, which we know nothing about who is who, you know, in the photos. And that, that was quite interesting for us. And then, up until now, you know, we, we don't have a space because we uh, built the new building. So I, I just want to show you uh, quickly about what we have done in the past. You know, I mean, this one is before I joined. And um, it is very um, kind of very heavily focused on textile. And this exhibition called Power Dressing, you know, and it has been uh, curated by Susan Conway, and she's a specialist of textiles from SOAS University in London. And her idea is to kind of uh, show the textile from the north of Thailand, which is Lana Kingdom, and also the Shan State in Burma, and, and showing how textile can be a representation or even uh, can carry the political statements, you know, which is uh, connect mostly with the, the power you know, and political message. And then we also work with the uh, contemporary artists, you know, in 2006, we invite uh, uh, the woman uh, artist and activist from Indonesia. Her name is Arayamani, and um, we invite her to work in 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 Jim Thompson. And she proposed us to work in the deep south of Thailand, which is a very interesting area. I mean, deep south of Thailand is used to be part of Malaysia, 
and it also uh, a kind of the majority of that area is Muslim, you know, and ha it has been introduced to the region since 13th or 14th century. And of course, because of the ideas of Thainess and the nationalism that has been emerged in, in Europe and also in the region, you know, since the early 20th century, the, the, the Thai government always trying to assimilate them, assimilate them, you know, and they wanted these people to be like the Muslim and the Malay Muslim to be Thai Muslim, and which is very politics, very, very political. And I would, I would like to uh, emphasize that the, 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 um, the difference between the, the Muslim in Thailand and the Muslim in Burma was quite different because like if you remember the, the, the story of Rohingya, right? Burma, they have a policy of exclusion. You are not part, you are not one of us. You know, we, we want to kick you out. And the problem of Thailand is the government trying to include them, you know, assimilate the, the, the Muslim in Thailand. So this is the difference between Rohingya and uh, the Muslim in the Deep South. So for us, you know, I, I mean, uh, Jim Thompson, our center during those times said, no, it's too dangerous, you know, to go to the Deep South of Thailand because we didn't really know anyone, you know, during those times, we don't have the contact. So the artist started to look at the, the Muslim community next door. And she, the, her idea is to, um, to, to kind of introduce or to explore like the difference between the Muslim in the Middle East and other area with the Muslim lifestyle, especially women in Southeast Asia, which is totally different, you know, from from uh, uh, Middle East uh, country. So uh, they invited the, 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 all the, the kids, you know, from the area, you know, to, to do the workshop. And the artist asked them to draw and to make a dress. Like what kind of dress you want to make, you know, and for what occasion. So this is their drawing. And, and we make the dress for them. We make two. One we give, we give to the kids and one we exhibit in the exhibitions and and then on the opening days you know we did the performance so this is quite um, interesting like way to work with um, the, the communities and then during during those uh, this period you know we, we started to look at the more on social history and in in Thailand I, I'm not sure about um, the difference like about the maybe I, I just went to the Museum of the Uprising uh, yesterday. And I, I heard that um, this kind of um, narrative has not been like revealed you know, and told right, in, in the past. Right? I think it's quite similar to, to us, but for us, you know, we cannot still dig into this untold narrative you know, in, 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 in the country, especially uh, on the leftist side, you know, or the communist kind of, um, who were considered as an anti-state, right? Because Thailand in the in the Cold War is very much pro-America and pro like a democratic system. So the artist uh, Apichat Pongwir Setakun, he went back to his hometown, which is the northeast of Thailand, and he was he on the way to make the film. You know, uh, Uncle Bun Mi, uh, who can recall his past life which is won the, uh, the awards from Khan's Film Festival. He found out about, like, um, you know, he, he, he went to the temple and the monk gave him the book about one guy who can recall his past life. Right? So this is very much rely on the, the ideas of psychical time, right, that, that I spoke about, uh, these Buddhist ideas of psychical time, which we believe in re reincarnation, right? So, um, so his, his work is to follow the guy. You know, he's trying to look at this Uncle Bunmi, which he crossed to Laos, you know, he, he went around the area. And instead of finding Uncle Bunmi, he found something else. The story of the communists, uh, the farmer communists, which they call the comrade uh, farmers, who were anti the government you know, during the 60s. And there was one village that has been the first time that they were fighting with the government. And, and that village, he went to talk to the teenagers and they know nothing about this part, this part of history. So what he did was he built this time machine 
this for him, you know, is time machine. And he asks these uh, teenagers, you know, to, to stay there, you know, and to think about the past, you know, that they have never been told by the parents' generation about this, uh, this, this side of this, the, the, I would call it a small narrative. So uh, this is one of the projects that we, we did with him, you know, it's called the project called Primitive, which is, is a, a one chapter of the, the film, Uncle Bun Me. And then I also did another project with um, an exhibition about, you know, video art and photography, which is in investigates social memory in Southeast Asia. So what, what I try to do is to bring the, this kind of untold stories and a small narrative from, from everywhere, you know, in Southeast Asia, and especially this younger generation, that uh, this one is very important kind of case. I don't know if you know uh, this artist, you know, Wandi Ratana. He he's quite he's very young uh, journalist, and um, and he kind of faced the, the the problem of Cambodia, you know, after the Khmer Rouge, and that generation will not talk about this. So as a young journalist, you know, he went around the country and then he saw this, this pond, you know, in, in the rice field. And then he asked villagers, like, what is this? It's very beautiful, you know, and he just photographed it. And then the, the farmers and people said, that it's a bomb pond, you know, that has been dropped by um, American, you know, during the, the Cold War as well as this, uh, the Khmer Rouge uh, period, and f and and then he started to go around that area and take a photograph, and I think it was really beautiful. You know, like the, this artist kind of started to explore that 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 memory that has never been told, you know, by their father generation. And this uh, another piece by Wong Hoi Chong. You know, he's an artist from Malaysia, and his work is pretty much based on colonial, um, post-colonial approach, he was invited to work in, um, in Austria. And then he created these reverse versions of colonization by, it's like, what if Malaysia used to be, used to be the colonizer of uh, Austria? So, and then he kind of like uh, reversed that uh, colonization. So he created this, um, make up the story that, you know, the because now Malaysia is very rich, you know, and then this uh, Austrian lady will come to work in, in Malaysia as a servant. It was so beautiful story. <laughs> and, I, I, and, and, and then there was the tourist, Austrian tourist, they went to Jim Thompson and said, oh my God, you know, can I have this video I want to show to my students, you know, in, in Vienna. I was like, okay. So it's the, the title, the title called Relooking, you know, and it was quite old piece you know, in 2002, but I think it was really interesting. I mean, these artists from this, uh, the, 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 the Southeast Asia, they started to look at those history and they, they create this alternate uh, narrative, you know, and this is another artist who is now very, very um, popular around Asia. His name is Ho Sing Yen. And this is his early work that he kind of counter narrative of the, the birth of Singapore. Because in the mainstream narrative of the, the, the origin of Singapore, it's like it's found by Stamford Ruffle, you know, like the British uh, governors who based in Indonesia. And actually, Ruffle was based in Indonesia and he was in Singapore only 10 days. And Singapore was really proud that, you know, he's like, a father of our countries, you know, it was really crazy. So what Ho Zeng Yen did was he go back to look at the, the almanac of Malaya. And he said, no, it's not true. It's not Ruffle. But this is the prince, you know, Utama. He is the one, you know, who found this land, you know, because Singapore came from the word Singapura. Singha is lion and Pura is a city, you know. Singapore is a city of lion. Right, so, so he created this like a reenactment of the history of um, the the um, the founders, the origin of Singapore. Yeah, it's a video and a painting. It's a very nice piece. Okay, so more and more, I mean, I I we we, we you know because of this regional perspective, we started to work with um, the artists and also uh, 
I mean art critics, sorry, not artists, art critics and curators, uh, Australian who based in, in Singapore. You know, I, we invite him to look at the collections at the house and uh, interpret and invite artists you know, to kind of uh, correspond with the collections um, more conceptually because the boards of the house, uh, Jim Thompson Thai house, is very they will not accept our proposal because we always ask them, like, can we ask the artist to do some kind of intervention with your collection, you know? So I'm really happy to see the show here that you allow, you know, I mean, an open interpretation by artists, by performers, right? For us, you know, it took us more than 10 years, you know, to convince them that, can we do something like that? So with this project, we cannot touch it. So we ask the artist to go to see the house and then respond to them conceptually, you know, so this is how it goes. I think it's quite beautiful that uh, David did a very good job, you know, he invited artists from Cambodia, you know, from Indonesia and from like many countries in Southeast Asia. And this is my project which I kind of explore the, um, the moving image in Southeast Asia by looking at the modernizations, uh, urban condition, diaspora, and identity. This is part of my um, DFA project, which I think is quite um, interesting, you know, to um, go back a little bit further, you know, because before I always focus on a uh, Cold War, and I think actually it's not true. When I was do doing Guangzhou Biennale, I, I, I get into more like, geopolitics and I think most of the problem we have now uh, in the region, you know, because of this border dispute, you know, and like I've kind of no idea how to draw the map, you know, from the dinner table in London or wherever, you know, so it's like, it's really crazy problem now, you know, I mean, in the north of Thailand with Chan states and also the south of Thailand and everything has been kind of a remnant of the colonized, uh, colonization period. It's not only Cold War, yeah. So that's why I kind of trace back a little bit further, not only 60, 40, uh, 70 years, but more than 100 years, yeah. And then we also kind of, uh, we tr I mean, for me, you know, I try not to be trapped in only the textile project because of the Jim Thompson and the silk business, right? And even though we are not part of the company, but sometimes we, we work with them. So this project is the last project of the space that we invite uh, Mela Yasma, the artist and curators from Shemati Foundation based in Yogyakarta. We asked her to, uh, we kind of interested in one of the museum of Batik in, uh, in Solo, which is one hour from, from, from Yogya. And we asked uh, that, that museum, you know, to, like we wanted to, to borrow their collections and also we want to see how the, the younger generation artists from Indonesia interact with the, the batik, which doesn't mean anything to them today, you know, or it doesn't mean anything, you know, or how they see the batik in their contemporary society. So this is what uh, it happened. And after that, we successfully convinced the board that we would like to invite artists to do something in the house. So this is a project by John Wang. Uh, he is one of the artists from New York. And, he's, and it, this project is part of the Ghost Festival curated by Gorakrit Aruna Nonchai, a young artist also based in New York. And the idea of uh, John is to interact with this, um, the two, actually for a uh, spirit guardians from Myanmar. So he went to Myanmar, uh, to Yangon, and then he, he asked the spirit mediums, you know, to perform in front of the camera. And this project is amazing, and it's really create us a lot of trouble because we face a lot of spiritual problem, especially ghosts, you know, so it's like everything is not working, you know, so we have to kind of pray, so to, to the spirit house, you know, and, and at the end, you know, I call my fortune tellers, like, what is happening? So, and it's just like, hmm, what, what is this, the, 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 the problem? So I explained to her that nothing is working, you know, it's like almost like a less kaput, you know, so every day, you know, we have to fix things. And then she said, oh, you know what, maybe the, the, um, the, 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 
the body that has been possessed, you know, in the spirit medium is a, a princess from, uh, from Myanmar. So you have to apologize her. So what we did was we set up the whole kind of flowers, you know, and candles. And we asked me and my team and all the, the, the guys, you know, like three, 20 people, you know, we standing and we set up like this beautiful table in front of TV and then we pray. <laughs> So this is like, I'm not going to do this again. <laughs> this is crazy. So we speak about animism, right? Okay, this, <laughs> this is real. Like, it happened last year. I mean, this is what I call anachronistic. I mean, I <laughs> okay, this is actually is not happening yet, but it's the, I mean, um, is it the, the, the simulation? So this is our building, and this is Jim Thompson House. This is all art center, and this is Ban Krua. You know, we have a small canal here. So the new building will look like totally modern, which I think is good. You know, I don't want to be looks very traditional, and people always kind of misunderstood us. So this one will be finished in next year, the end of next year. So you are welcome to go to Thailand. And I will have a white wall. I'm so happy because the old space is gray wall with vitrines and everything. So I really look forward to have white wall space. <laughs> and we will have a, very, a bigger um, library. And also the space itself is not that big. It's only 300 square meters. But the whole building is 3,000 square meters with parking lot. And, and then we have a... a quite big um, uh, multifunctional room. Yeah. So besides the exhibitions, we did a lot of educational program and also workshop. And we are very happy that we host uh, Benedict Anderson, you know, who wrote the book about imagined communities. And he's like our hero, you know, because uh, Benedict Anderson went to Thailand all the time before he uh, passed away in Indonesia. So I, I, I think it's, it's quite interesting to have him and and he was really influential in, in terms of if anyone who's interested in the nationalistic or nationalism uh, theories, right? So, um, am I okay with the time? Ten minutes, okay. I have a little bit more, like 20 slides. <laughs> I can go fast. <laughs> but this one is like the project that we do outside of the art center, right? And. Uh, as, as I told you before, that, uh, for us, you know, it's very important to work outside of Bangkok and outside of the countries because, because of these ideas of very static tightness and the ideas of um, like very uh, Bangkok-centric. You know? So my proposal for my friends and also the, the boss is like, we should do something outside, you know. So we started to create a project which is called like decentralizing process, you know, of the art scene and activities in Bangkok. And we work with the Northeast again, you know, why? Because after Jim Thompson disappeared, people at Ban Krua community, they will not do anything. They said, we, will, we want to wait for him to come back. But the problem is the company, they, they got a lot of like orders from many countries. So they were looking at the weavers and they went around Thailand and then they kind of found the community in the northeast of Thailand, which is closer to Laos and they are very good at weaving, weaving uh, silk. So they started to, 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 in, uh, to launch the kind of factory and later they have the farms there. This is how it looks. The farm is almost like um, a Disneyland for me. You know? I mean, uh, horticultures, flowers, and fauna. But why do we do this? You know, they do the farm tour since like more than 10 years ago. The, the thing is, before they trying to create this high, kind of holistic approach, you know, of cr making silk, you know, from growing until like, you know, um, producing the, the silk. And then later, they're working with the contract farmers in uh, in northeast part of, of the country because that, that, that 
that area and your people are very poor and and then the, I think the boards of the company is trying to work with them, you know, like create a job, you know, for, for these people. But they suffer because they have a lot of lands, for example, about 3,000, right, which is 1,500 acres. And they don't use it because they, they, because they give the job, you know, and to the farmers. So they have to think like how to make use of this land, right? So what they did was uh, they're trying to kind of open it up to the people and then they, they let people come in and see what they have, you know, especially like uh, what they collect. They started to collect the um, traditional house from Isan. And then this is what we did. They asked us to invite artists to do the project in the farm as part of the farm tour. And in the first five years, in, from 2009 to 2013, it's more or less like installation, you know, and then, you know, uh, when af after the farm tour finished, we dismantle it, right? So I think it's quite interesting to see the growth, you know, of this project. Because we, we started to work with artists and we wanted to create something more permanent. And like this one, we, we asked the artist from uh, Thailand who's the woman and she's working with like the woman form of the bodies, especially like breast, you know. And this is the permanent um, kind of uh, sculptures that we allow the, the plants to grow. And we also um, work with chef, you know, and, and then, like now, they we're preparing for the next farm tour. And from like 15 years ago, we have, I mean, each time we open around one month. So we got about three, 200 to 300,000 people visited the farm, which is quite interesting numbers of people. Yeah. And then not only the architectures and also the agriculture kind of setting that we work with, in the northeast part of Thailand, but we also interested in the the music, you know, which is, uh, and I think Thai people. I mean, I'm talking about people from Bangkok. They always look down these the the people from Isan area because they are very poor, and then they came to the city to work as the maids and taxi drivers, you know. But and later, you know, these people become like uh, they travel around the world because of this. They become like an overseas laborers. So we are working with this kind of music, you know, and we, which is derived from like animism traditions, you know, and Buddhist traditions and also repertoire. And then it becomes very popular in the 60s and 70s, especially during the Cold War, because Isan area again, you know, become the base, you know, for American. And this is how this traditional music met American funk and all this kind of jazz music, you know. And it's, it, it was really interesting combination of very traditional and very international kind of uh, uh, crossovers. So we, we started to collect this kind of music and then the, the company asked us to take care of this um, Molam music. And they wanted to create a museum of this kind of music. I said, what, you know? I know nothing about this music, so we have to do a lot more research on this. So everything has been like, um, you know, inventories, and we, we still work on this uh, as a research, and, and we don't have the budget to do the museum yet, so we transformed the exhibitions that we did in Jim Thompson House to the bus. And this is the best part. <laughs> we bring it to the cities, to everywhere, in the Isan regions, and we work with the students. You know, we give a talk. We even join the like the temple festivals. You know, and it's really part of the communities. You know, and I never seen. I mean, like this. You know, it was really nice to see these kids. You know, enjoy this music and see the show. And then we also join this very kind of posh uh, music festival in 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 Thailand. <laughs> so it's like from the temples, you know, to this very high-end music festival. This is where we are at the moment, you know. And it happens like every uh, uh, December. So if anyone are interested in this kind of music, you know, it, it was one of the best uh, music festival in, in Thailand. Look how it goes. So this one, it was really interesting because the bus was the bus that 
they use for the workers you know, in the company. And we transformed this bus into the exhibition space. And then just the day before yesterday, I saw the pictures of Lebanon, the, the, the demonstration in Lebanon. And they, they were on the bus like this, you know, it was like, are they in the music festival, you know, or they are in the protest, like political protest. I mean, it was really interesting to see how like visual kind of uh, culture can be very fabricated and... Okay, I think that's it. Yeah. You can ask me more questions. Thank you very much for this um, like fascinated, fascinating tour uh, uh, yeah, to Thailand and to the role of contemporary art. Um, maybe before I, I pass the mic to the public, I would like to ask a question of um, how would you like briefly define, because you were showing different examples, how it works on different levels, but how would you briefly um, define the um, uh, relationship of, um, of uh, Thai society, Thai people living in Bangkok, maybe, uh, to contemporary art? Is it a kind of a natural... Uh, visual language that they are used to confront with and uh, yeah so that would be my first question yeah. I also had the second okay. um, it, it is very good question because I have to, uh, to 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 say that I mean it's not only contemporary art right how Thai people react or associate with the museum culture I would like to extend your questions to this concept of the museum which I always say that the, the, the beginning of the museum in Thailand and Southeast Asia did not derive from the Enlightenment. This is one important fact, you know, that people always complain, how come people are not going to the museum? You know, like, this is not part of our cultures, right? This is one. But why? Why is not part of our culture? Because, because it's not it was not uh, derived from the Enlightenment because the beginning of the museum in Thailand, it started where? In the garage of the king's palace, which no one can enter. And then the, the, the rationale of the king, you know, like, he's, he, who is his audience? International audience that he wanted to show it's a tool, you know, for the king, like, we are also civilized. <laughs> this is what we have, right? And then Rama V, King Rama V, he, start, he started to change when he went to Jawa to see Pattaya, to see Indone uh, Indonesia, like, oh, we need to, to build our own museum. So he, that, uh, he changed the concept of the garage museum of his father, you know, to make like, okay, we have a building, but, of course, again, you know, it's not for us. He opened once a year for the public, only for his birthday. This is absolute monarchy, okay? <laughs> and then what happened again? But, but the thing is, I really like this, um, the, to, to study about the exhibitions and museum history in Thailand. But you know what he did? He kind of um, uh, trying to ident I mean, distinguish between the ideas of the museum and exhibitions. So even though he did not open the museum for the public every day, but he always have the festival, like they have um, exhibitions on the main ground, you know, and like for the public space to access. And that was quite interesting, you know, and, and that's a lot, a lot of uh, people studies this uh, history of exhibition. And if you see the history of the arts in Thailand, when did we have the first art museum? 1970s, right? Of course, it's not part of our life. But when we, uh, we have the BACC or we have more institutions, um, and even like started from the 90s, the artists trying to kind of bring the works to the public, you know, and, and because we don't have a space, we use, there was a, one movement in Chiang Mai, the north of Thailand. The artists use market, use public space, use graveyards, you know, use temple 
to show the world. But still, you know, it doesn't mean that you put the arts on the street and people will see it, right? So I think it, it, it's kind of like gradually evolved, you know, the, that, you know, of course, you know, in the 90s, the audience is very small, you know, in 2000, when we have uh, Jim Thompson Art Center and BACC, Bangkok Arts and Culture Center is quite important because it was in, uh, situated right in the middle of the city and it was funded by the public and it's free. So you know how many people go to that museum? 5,000 people a day. Okay. Yes. So this is the change like, you know, from 100 years, you know, like from no one can access the museum up until 500 people a day. Yeah. Okay, and, um, and uh, so my second question and the last one would be um, how the political situation in Thailand right now influences, if it does, uh, the um, uh, institutional art mm -hmm. life or um, contemporary art institutions? If you, if you would like to answer this question, of course. Yeah, yeah I, I think it... Mm. It is not easy to, to express your ideas freely because of, you know, we have a draconian, draconian law, which is Article 1112, that you cannot criticize the monarchy, right? And I think it, of course, you know, artists always trying to <laughs> test the water. <laughs> I mean, you, you kind of like, okay, you, you know that there's a big two, three elephants in the room, you know, and then you cannot talk about it. Like, I mean, if, if you want to show the work or you want to do something like this, you know, in the public institution, it's of course, you know, it will be censored, right? So what they did was, it's the same as you guys, right? I mean, or even in the country that has been limited uh, freedom of expression, they go underground. They go underground, they go above ground, outside of the country. Like for me, you know, I, I just told Martha that, okay, don't put my talk on YouTube because I don't want to be arrested. <laughs> like I don't want to talk about something that I cannot talk about, you know? So it was really like, it was, and then at the end, you know, you have self-censorship, which is really, it's, it's much tougher than being censored by institution. And now, because of the, the hybrid kind of a democratic system, we have military, right? And activism is very, very tough, you know? I mean, every day we would hear the news that so-and-so was arrested, you know, a student has been arrested. And, and the artists, just last two years, they started to shut down the exhibition. I mean, the military came and shut down the show. That was the first time that we, we hear this kind of news, you know, from the, the contemporary art. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay, so anybody, some questions? Please feel free to ask. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so yeah, that would be all for today. Thank you very much for for this uh, interesting insight into into your practice and um, and the contemporary art landscape in in Thailand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much.